I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be talking about JavaScript templating, Flexbox, the dev tools, and more. Let's check it out. First up, we have a new JavaScript templating system called Endash. Now, this is a really, really interesting entry to the market because it supports two-way binding of JavaScript variables and templates. It uses Backbone's models as its backbone. Huh? I get it. Huh? And uh, no, it's it's really cool. So let's let's check it out. Um, so here's the website. Endash is a two-way binding JavaScript templating framework built on top of semantic HTML. What do those words mean? I don't know. So here, let's check it out. Um, we have right here. What is your name? Tony Stark. Well, I'm gonna say my name is Nick Pettit. Welcome, Nick Pettit. Why? Thank you very much. Website. Here I am. So let's see what happens here. This this text that you see right here, where it says "Welcome, Nick Pettit." is being rendered only by this little template right here. And it shows the name with a hyphen and a class that has name. So what is actually going on here? Well, this is actually a pretty decent sized framework, so we're not gonna go into everything that it does, but just see it's pretty easy to set up and use. So as you saw in the beginning, it uses Tony Stark as the name, so you'll see that throughout the rest of this. Uh, so anyway, Really, really easy. You set up a new backbone model, and then you grab the template for it, and render the template using the HTML method. So uh, it goes through, and we actually have documentation on everything it does. There's variables. You can either interpolate the variables or strictly bind them to the template. You can see there is a ton of stuff that this supports. You can loop through different variables. So they have an example here where if you've got a backbone collection, all you need to do is add this little data dash each attribute to your div, and boom, you're good to go. It supports conditionals, like you would expect, as well as partials. Now, uh, partials are really interesting uh, because of scoping. So if you have, like in this example, a user that has a hobby attribute, you can scope down and say, hey, I've got this scope. So the first one is the user, and then if you just add the class hobby, that gives you the scope of the hobby. Anyway, this is a really, really interesting framework that supports just a ton of stuff. We are not going to get into everything on the show, but I definitely recommend checking it out. It's called Enddash. Very nice. Well, next up is the ultimate Flexbox cheat sheet. I had to sure. look at the, the website to see what it was. I'm glad it's the ultimate one because I didn't want to waste my time with anything except that, right? The ultimate. Exactly. You want the best, and uh, we got it for you. So, <laughs> boom. Right here, uh, they have the table of contents, but uh, first I should explain what Flexbox is. It's basically a brand spanking new CSS layout module. So if you've been using floats to position your elements for years and years, I have. There's finally a new way with Flexbox. You can go ahead and position elements uh, using this new CSS layout tool. So. If we scroll down here, basically what you'll find on the site is a bunch of examples as to how you can use Flexbox. Now, I admittedly have not gotten into Flexbox as much as I should have. I've only really started using it, but browser support is starting to become pretty good. So now's a good time to start learning about it. If you scroll down here, they have even more examples that show you how to create multiple columns, how to position elements, on all different sides of the page. Uh, they even have one example here, yeah, that shows you how to make one column twice as large as the other column. You can do some pretty fascinating stuff with Flexbox, and as you can see, it's very little code, whereas if you were to do this with floats, you'd have to actually use a ton of code and probably a lot more elements as well, uh, like they do in Bootstrap. You have to have a row, right. and you have to have, you know, each one of your columns and, and so on. So this is a much better alternative. Again, it's still a little bit on the horizon, but it's gonna be here pretty soon. So definitely start uh, start learning it. And this is a good way to, uh, to get started. It's cool how the web has been around for years and years and years, and we can finally make one column twice as big as another column. 
it really, easily. It really is truly amazing how long that took. It, it used to just be uh, that they were documents and you really just could change the fonts and colors right. and that was kind of what it was meant for. Well, not anymore. We've, so We've come a long way. We have. Uh, next up, we have a really nice blog post on five advanced techniques for debugging JavaScript and the web um, using mainly the dev tools, but also some other interesting tools. So uh, let's check this out. This is on the Badoo blog. I think that's how you pronounce it. I am not sure because there is a small dot inside one of the O's, and I don't know how to pronounce that. So. The first thing that they mention is using something called the Web Inspector Remote. Now, what does the Web Inspector Remote do? Well, it's a debugger for web pages, but the really interesting part of it is that it lets you work remotely. So you can debug web pages on a mobile device like a phone or maybe a tablet. Now, this is a Node plugin, uh, so you, you run it and then you get started and then you go through your phone and anything you enter into the dev tools works. Next up that's really interesting that I didn't know about it is DOM breakpoints. Now, it's pretty standard while you're trying to debug your JavaScript applications to maybe put in a breakpoint so when the code hits it, it will stop. You know, you can have a chance to inspect what's going on. But you can actually do that for individual DOM elements as well. So if you go through into the DOM tree, you can see right here they've right-clicked an H1 element, and you can say break on subtree modifications, attribute modifications, or node removal. This is going to be incredibly helpful when you're going through, you're trying to find something that is modifying an element, and maybe you're not exactly sure where it is. So that'll allow you to just step through the code much easier and much quicker than it would be uh, it, with other methods of debugging. Um, next, there is a debugger statement. You can actually just throw the debugger statement into your code and it'll stop, give you a debugger right there, boom, done. Uh, you also have the ability to hook into native methods with the debugger, which is going to be really, really, really valuable to use when you are not exactly sure what's going on. The example that they give is having the set attribute method on the on any element throw a debugger statement so if you are really having a hard time hard time trying to see where an attribute's being set just debug right there and then the final advanced javascript debugging technique that they have is mapping remote scripts locally with a tool called charles proxy which is actually an amazing proxy tool for debugging network connections and it's a paid tool but it's actually worth every penny and they show you how to go through and use remote urls locally uh, so you can go through and edit the files there now um, you know they do bring up different things that you want to take into account like oh you know i know chrome supports this why would i do this well charles is actually extremely powerful and you should do this in situations where maybe the source map doesn't work or you don't have access to all the source code so anyway, this is a really thorough post. I kind of just scratched the surface on how to do these things. Make sure you check it out in the show notes, which you can get to at youtube.com slash go treehouse, or by searching for us on iTunes at The Treehouse Show. Very cool. Well, next up is a wonderful post from the CodeDrops blog called Animated Opening Type. Now, when I first heard that, I was like, huh, what, what, what the heck is this? Well, let's view a demo of it and find out. Let's do it. If I go ahead and hover over any of these letters here, you can see that they actually open up in 3D. Is this a web page or a Pixar movie? And they move away from the page. I know, it's incredible. They even have these little shadows here, uh, in addition to the hole that's being cut out in the page and the little paper-like letter that's popping out of it. It's almost like an advent calendar or something. It's pretty amazing. You can go ahead and just eat all the chocolate there. Okay, so let's go ahead and go back to this article and take a look at how this is working. It just uses some uh, simple list items for the markup, and inside each list item, they have a span element, and then they have the data letter attribute, which is just an attribute that they made up using the HTML5 data attribute, and they put the same letter inside of that. Uh, more on that in a second. So if we scroll down here, we can look at the CSS. Uh, the span is not very interesting. They're basically just setting some boilerplate styles there. It's more interesting down here, though, 
when they set the before and after pseudo classes and they're actually using the content attribute here data letter so that they can go ahead and duplicate that letter and then apply various transitions to it. So they're doing a transition or excuse me a transform here and they're skewing it along the z-axis so towards the the screen or the user and they do a similar technique to create the shadow. Um, anyway, not a whole lot to say about this. It, it doesn't have really great browser support because it uses, um, you know, a lot of 3D. It's using pseudo elements, so you got to be a little bit careful there. But uh, still, a very cool demo and very clever way of using pseudo elements and transforms to create a pretty neat effect. Yeah, that's that's really awesome. Mm -hmm. Uh, next up, I'm just going to call this the uh, DevTools slash JavaScript episode because we've got so many links on DevTools here. I'm okay with that. Yeah, we have a, a collection of DevTools snippets. Now, I didn't know this, but both Chrome and Firefox support this concept of snippets, or Firefox calls it a scratch pad, where you can save little bits of JavaScript that do certain things, and then you can use them in the DevTools. What? What? I know. Crazy. So these have been collected. There is a handful, I think it's like 12 to 16 different little functions that you can use inside the dev tools. Let's go ahead and check them out. Now, if you're wondering how to use the uh, snippets feature, there is a walkthrough on the GitHub page on how to use the snippets in Chrome. There's actually a snippets tab, so you can add whichever ones you want. And you can also add them in the Firefox scratch pad. So these dev tool snippets are Really, really interesting. You can print out all of the different colors on a web page. And why would you want a color picker? Well, you can go through and see all of the computed styles or using a stylized console.log to visualize each color. What? Yeah. And then there's the snippet right after that. This one's really useful. There is a cache buster, which will actually remove things from inside of the browser cache, which can be really, really, really useful when you can't figure out why something is going wrong or not. Um, tons of stuff here, saving thing, saving JSON to your local page, prettify CSS, reload CSS right from the, uh, the console right there, um, using data URIs for your attributes. Anyway, not going to go through all of them. You can find a link in the show notes. Ton of them. Go ahead, use this. Great link. Boom. Easy. Pretty cool stuff. Well, next up, is a, a post called Color Template, or I guess it's not really a blog post. It's basically this page that explains color theory, and it does a really great job of it. Uh, we do teach this on Treehouse, by the way, so be sure to check that out. But this is a really wonderful visual explanation of color theory, and it can help you pick the right colors for your designs, and that's especially useful if you're not familiar with color theory or you know, if you're a developer and you're not too confident in your design skills, definitely be sure to check this out. So they start off with the color wheel, which is kind of obvious there, but then they get into some color definitions. So they define the three primary colors and they show you how to create secondary colors or tertiary colors there. And then they talk about color relationships. So monochromatic analogous and complementary colors. That's pretty cool. They talk about color harmony, warm and cool colors, which is basically how the color wheel can be separated here between the warmer side and the cooler side. And they talk about triads. That's really use useful to know. I thought this was interesting. They talk about rationing color, and basically they're just saying how much of each color you should use on a web page. So for example, if you wanted something to stand out more than a lot of other elements and you're using color to create a contrast there, you'd want to go ahead and use a very small amount of that color. So for example, if you have a call to action button and you wanted to say, you know, hey, buy now, you want that button to be a different color than everything else on the page, or at least that's one way that you could highlight that. Uh, anyway, really useful uh, post, and they also have some nice links down here to some tools that can help you pick colors and create a color scheme for your website. So, very cool stuff. I, I really like this a lot. Yeah, that's that's pretty nifty. Mm -hmm. Uh, next up, we have another blog post on the dev tools. Nick, there's console.log, which you can use to print out log messages to the console, but did you also know there is a function called console.table? 
I did not know that, actually. Yeah, this is, this is super interesting. If you have, say, an array of different JavaScript objects, you can use the console.table method, and it will actually print all this out in a table. That's cool amazing. That? Yeah. So there is an array that we have right here. Uh, it's a variable called languages, has the name and the file extension. And this is what it would look like if you used console.log. You would get a little array representation of your data. But you can also do this with console.table. And it will give you a nicely formatted table if you just reload the page. Boom. You get a nice little table view. Uh, and, I mean, that's it. Really, really not much to say. It works with objects as well as arrays. You can even filter these things as long as you call the console.table method and then tell it what to filter on. So that's really cool. A nice little hidden feature of the dev tools. Yeah, no, that's pretty amazing. You can actually find out more about the dev tools on the Google Developers uh, Chrome Dev Tools documentation. Is that the only place? It's not the only place. We actually just released a course on Treehouse called Chrome DevTools Basics. And I taught that course, and it's pretty awesome. We go over all the different panels in the Chrome DevTools, so be sure to check that out on Treehouse. Jason mentioned the console.table uh, method, but there's also a whole bunch of other console uh, methods that you can call, and they're all listed out in the console API reference here. And one of the functions that we go over is console.time and .time end, where you can actually time how long it takes for some of your code to execute. So that's, you know, a good thing to use when you're trying to debug your code and figure out, you know, maybe what, uh, what bits are taking a long time. So anyway, Really cool stuff. Yeah. I'm at NickRP on Twitter. And I'm at, I, whew, and I am unable to pronounce my Twitter handle, so just see the show notes for it, which you can find at youtube.com slash go treehouse or by searching for us in iTunes at the Treehouse Show. And of course, if you'd like to see more videos like this one about web design, web development, mobile business, and so much more, be sure to check us out at teamtreehouse.com. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next week.